Welcome back to the show today. We are talking about sexy basketball versus boring or ugly basketball. I want to get into what makes people say they like watching one guy's game. Or hey, that team is really fun to watch. And then on the other hand, you'll hear people describe a certain team as hard to watch. Sometimes that hard to watch team isn't even a bad team. They actually have a pretty good record. But aesthetically, they're bad. Their strategy or the way they play the game just doesn't do it for some people. So I decided to divide play styles into four different categories. Beautiful, ugly, sexy, and boring. So let's start with beautiful. We'll start and we'll end with positive categories. I don't like ending these videos on a sour note. So I think the most commonly described characteristic of beautiful basketball is ball movement or fluid passing. I think the main reason people find it so pleasing is because it showcases teamwork. Naturally, I think people want to watch people work together to achieve something larger than themselves. So when you watch a play where every single player touches the ball and they never hold the ball for more than one or two seconds, kind of looks like it's a magic trick or a choreographed dance that happens to be improvised. I know it's not it's an oxymoron. You can't overlook the fact that you're only going to get this type of basketball if a team has chemistry, like personal chemistry, like they actually like each other and they're familiar with each other. Because there's an element of unselfishness and trust to it. As the ball moves around the court and the defense shifts around and eventually gets behind, players become more and more open for a shot until one player has a completely open look at the basket. And then the trust element comes in cuz you have to believe that your teammate can make that shot. The guy with the ball doesn't have to second guess the guy he's passing it to. He just sees an open jersey and he passes the ball. I think that's why the Warriors championship teams were so good. Because everyone could shoot or pass. And their movement off the ball was incredible too. There was never anyone that just took a play off. Nobody stood in the corner and just hoped that Steph would have an ISO situation. That never happened. Also, I think another understated part of that Warriors team is everyone was really good at shot faking. Because they were good at catch and shoot threes, defenders would bite all the time. Allowing them to collect the ball and then dribble. They could shoot or they could just dish it out to a guy that's even more open than them. They also did that thing where they would drive the lane and then the big would come out and they just drop it off to the big on their team. I'm not a Warriors fan, all right? I don't like the Warriors, but I know I'm glazing this team, but they were really good and they are a fun team to watch if you're looking for great basketball. The whole team was so selfless. I've talked about this before, but I really admire that they welcome KD on their team. Steph especially, because he was the guy on the Golden State Warriors. I mean, he still is, but he'd just come off of two MVPs. And now the only player that could probably come in and be the number one scoring option over him was KD. And he wanted to come and play on his team. Now I know a lot of people would say, yeah, of course Steph would want him on his team. He wants the best basketball team possible. They just lost to the Cavs. He wanted the team to be better. Yeah, that might be true, but let's be honest. There are a lot of players who were the stars of their teams that would have said absolutely not to having KD come on and usurp their power. They would have told KD to go get his own team. He's not gonna just come in and make them into a Scottie Pippen type. No thanks. But Steph wanted the Warriors to be as good as possible. Curry was even pissed when KD left in 2019. So I think that selfless attitude that Steph had made the whole thing possible. They played beautiful basketball and they played selfless basketball and it was winning basketball. I think good teamwork can even make defense look beautiful. Watching a zone communicate and shift around is pretty cool. Watching the offense get flustered or frustrated that they can't find a clean look is pretty badass. I like this example of the 2012 Boston Celtics playing full court press in the second quarter of a regular season game. The Nets aren't used to this and they don't really know what to do. The Celtics make the Nets look like a rec league team. They're doubling, they're cutting off passing lanes, so the Nets are forced to make these really awkward passes. Also, everyone on the Celtics is moving. No one's being lazy. When they switch on to a new man, they're playing them very close. I don't think I've ever seen a random regular season game where guys play defense like this. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, I'm just saying I've not seen it. So that's some good looking basketball right there. Now, let's talk about what people call boring basketball. I think the go-to example of what people refer to as watching a boring game of basketball is watching a game with Tim Duncan. Most people, not me. Tim Duncan's signature move was the bank shot, which when I was a kid, we were taught that that was the most effective shot. Swishes were kind of showboaty, like dribbling between the legs. But I don't know what people teach kids anymore. I don't even know if that's true. You rarely see bank shots anymore, so I assume it's not. If you do see a bank shot, it's usually a three-point shot from the key. And the dude's gonna be smiling after he sinks it because he knows no one believes that he meant to do that. So the main reason I think they thought Tim Duncan's bank shot was boring was because he did it all the time. Another reason was he was playing with guys like Shaq, who had a more aggressive style. They like to back guys down and then dunk on. Very embarrassing for the guy getting dunked on. You really didn't see any all-time posters from Tim Duncan, did you? Then on the defensive end, if he got a block, he wasn't the type to swat it out of the gym, like uh, Ben Wallace or Kevin Garnett. Those guys had really performative blocks. Duncan a lot of times would bring the ball down with his blocks. He'd smother the ball rather than smack it. So typically the ball would remain in play and then the Spurs could get the ball back and go on offense. I think it's actually fun to watch because he's just obstructing the shooter, 
from the hoop and it just turns into a block. So people talk about Tim Duncan's highlights being boring, but I think they're pretty sick. Mainly because all of Duncan's techniques worked and they worked consistently. He was able to dominate a lot of the league's best players. The dude won five championships. I'm talking Dirk, Blake Griffin, Kevin Durant. Duncan won 72% of the games in his career. Just for comparison, Kobe won 62% of the games in his career. Not necessarily saying that Duncan is better than Kobe. Just providing a little bit of context. So now let's talk about some ugly types of basketball. So for me, I think the best example of ugly basketball is foul baiters. Guys who play the game trying to draw fouls. Fortunately, the NBA has made some changes to the rules that make these foul baiting techniques move. In 2023, the NBA instituted the rip through rule, meaning the offensive player can't make contact with the defender's arm while moving the ball away from the basket. Basically what was happening was offensive players were ramming their arms into the defender's arms, making it look like they were getting fouled on a shot. And it did kind of look like the defender was committing the foul. Chris Paul did it a lot, KD did it a lot, Jason Tatum would do it here and there. Everyone did it, everyone was guilty, not picking on anyone, but it was mostly Chris Paul. He did it for most of his career, and for most of his career, it was a defensive foul. But damn, was it ugly basketball. Harden would also do a similar thing, where he would wrap his arm around a player and just kind of twist it up, and then he would act like the defender put the arm there when he really did it. I don't know how refs didn't notice what James Harden was doing. I guess it's a lot more deceptive when you're on the court, because from this angle, it just looks like cheating. But the rule was instituted right around the time he was traded to the Nets. Harden stopped getting those calls. This was also, coincidentally, right around when his scoring was cut in half. Well, like cut into a third, really. The other rule is known as the Trey Young rule. Trey Young was just known for doing this the most. Basically just launching himself into the defender while he was shooting. It's almost like an optical illusion, the way he looks like he's getting run into. But in reality, he's the one running into the defender. I guess when the NBA informed the teams of this new guideline change, the video clip they used as an example was a video clip of Trey Young doing it. He was not too pleased, apparently. The last example of ugly basketball that the NBA took care of was the kickout rule. At least, that's what I call it. When the shooting player sticks out his leg unnaturally, so that his leg hits the defender and then the shooting player falls over as if he were to be fouled. You can't do that anymore. As a matter of fact, you might get a technical foul if you do it. The NBA is over the theatrics. You can save your acting chops for your post-basketball career. Now, let's talk about sexy basketball. Everyone knows what I'm talking about. This is the type of basketball that sells tickets. Great dribblers like Allen Iverson, Kyrie Irving, Jamal Crawford, Big Dunkers, Aaron Gordon, Zach Levine, Anthony Edwards, and incredible passers, guys like Jokic, Jason Williams if you're old like me, or Luka Doncic. All these guys make it incredibly obvious that these NBA players are on another level than any of us athletically. But these players, as impressive as they are, those plays don't necessarily lead to winning basketball. Just because you may see a guy on the top 10 four nights a week doesn't necessarily mean his team is doing well. If you watch compilations of the best plays of any given season, it's never going to be a nutmeg, it's never going to be a behind-the-back pass, it's never going to be an alley-oop. It's usually a more beautiful play with context. It's either a game-winning shot or defensive play. Because context is what really gives the play emotional stakes. Think about LeBron and what is more than likely the highlight of his career. The Iguodala block, right? Sure, if you're just watching single bits of tape in a vacuum, it's not the best play. LeBron has done a lot cooler stuff. But the fact that it was game seven of the finals and there were two minutes left and the Cavs and Warriors were tied makes this block the play of his career. Because they won the game and they won the championship. If they had lost the game, no one would probably remember it, right? All right, thank you for being here. Please give me recommendations. I really appreciate them. I always, they're all recommendations now. I always reply to everything. If you like the video, like the video. If you disliked it, dislike the video. Be good to your mothers, eat a corn dog, and then talk to a stranger that's wearing a basketball shirt about basketball.